I ask that you would anoint this time, that you would touch each of us, that you would touch us by your spirit, that you'd open our hearts and our minds to hear you, and that we would grasp in new ways what you've done for us and who you are. Help us to grasp what it means to be truly forgiven and to embrace the great forgiveness you offer. Help us to fall in love with you, the giver of such grace and forgiveness. Help us to have courage to live it, Lord, out in this world that's so in need of people loving in the image of Jesus. Help us to be like that. Inspire us, Lord, and guide us. And use the scriptures this day to build up your church and to build up each of us as believers. We lay our hearts before you, Lord. We ask you to write upon them. And we welcome you, sweet Holy Spirit. Come and empower us, guide us, and lead us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus who gave himself for our forgiveness. Amen. Well, we continue our our series on forgiveness and today we're looking at the scandal of forgiveness it's very important when you when we talk about forgiveness if we're really going to experience it real forgiveness if you're really going to have the freedom that comes from forgiveness you have to really understand what forgiveness is there might be some misunderstandings about forgiveness some misunderstandings about what it is or, or how it works uh, it, there might be misperceptions, and, and by having these misperceptions, these wrong ideas, it actually keeps us from enjoying or experiencing the full freedom of God's forgiveness. So we got to understand it right, and one of the things to understand about it is, frankly, forgiveness is scandalous. Now, that might surprise you. Because we talk about forgiveness, even the story you just heard of that mom and, and going into such extraordinary means, lengths, to forgive the man who took her daughter's life. And we, in hindsight, we listen to that and, and we go, that's wonderful and it's powerful and it's moving and it's, it's good. But there's a scandalous side to that. There's a scandalous side to all forgiveness. And it's important to embrace that, to grasp that, because when you lose the sense of scandal, you're in danger, if you haven't already, of losing the sense of grace. Where there is no sense of scandal, there is little understanding of grace. And where there's no understanding of grace, where grace has been lost, there is no forgiveness, no real forgiveness. There might be misperceptions and wrong ideas, but forgiveness, as the Bible teaches, doesn't exist where grace does not exist. And where there is no scandal, grace has probably been lost. So let's think about that just on earthly terms. How does that work? Maybe to help clarify before we dive into the scriptures. Imagine the same scenes. Imagine yourself as a judge, and that case comes before you. A 24-year-old young man got drunk one night, hit a car, killed two 20-year-old girls. Absolutely devastating. And this young man is now in front of your court for sentencing. You've heard the whole story, you've heard the whole trial, and he's before you for sentencing. And imagine that this is what happens. This young man stands before you, and he is absolutely, indescribably overwhelmed with grief, with regret with sorrow that he can hardly even stand he is so sick at what happened and what he did he grieves it he regrets it he laments it he even despises himself what he's done because of it he is truly sorry and 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 as a judge you look and of course it can't happen in a real court but but you look at him And to the best of your ability, you genuinely believe that he means it from the heart. It's sincere. And you say to this young man, I believe that you are repentant. That you have shown contrition. You are sorry for your sin. And that you have turned from it. And you've asked for mercy and I give it to you. You are released. You are free to go. Now how do you think that would play in the press? Or among politicians that are clamoring and calling for getting tough with crime. And granted, you can't do that in real life in a court case. It's a different setting, to be sure. But you have to understand, see, the scandal, when we talk about our forgiveness, that's what God does to us. 
He looks at the murderers and the rapists and child molesters and everyday normal sinners like the rest of us. And when we come before him, not earning it, not deserving it, completely unworthy of it, through our own decisions and folly and wickedness, we have chosen a disastrous course and we come before his bench. And when we, and when we come grievously sad, and so distraught and say, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. The scandal of forgiveness manifests in God saying, I forgive you. You're free to go. You're free. I don't hold it against you any longer. There's a scandal to this. The releasing of the prisoner. The letting go of the captive. And if it isn't understood from that perspective, that radically, then it's not understood at all. Grace has been lost, and where grace has been lost, the absolute magnificent grace of God that just freely and lavishly releases the prisoner, the guilty, where that's been lost as a free gift, then so has forgiveness. So let's look at the passage as we dive in. This is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, and when I find this lady, this is one of my favorite people in the whole Bible, don't even know her name. But when I get to heaven, she's one of the first that I want to find. Listen to the word of God. And in keeping with the traditions of the church, since this is from the gospel, to honor Jesus, would you stand if you're able? Ancient tradition of the church. Listen to the word of God. Now, it happened that one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to his home for dinner. And Jesus came and reclined there at the table in his house. And look, a woman in that town who was a sinner learned that Jesus was dining at the house of the Pharisee. And she took an alabaster jar filled with perfumed oil and brought it to him. And she stood behind his feet weeping, weeping. And with her tears raining upon his feet, she wet them and knelt down and dried them off with her hair. And she kissed his feet and then anointed them with the perfumed oil. Now, when the Pharisee who'd invited Jesus for dinner saw all of this, he said inside his heart, if this man were really a prophet he would know what kind of woman is touching him and that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him and said, Simon, I have something I want to say to you. He said, fine, teacher, say it. Jesus said, there, were once, there was once a creditor and he had two debtors. One owed him 500 silver coins. The other owed 50. And when they were unable to pay him back, the creditor forgave the debt of both of them. Now, which of the two do you believe would love the creditor more? Simon replied, I suppose it would be the one who had the greater amount forgiven. Right, said Jesus. You have answered correctly. And then turning to look at the woman, he continued to talk to Simon, saying, Do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. And yet from the moment I came in, she has wet my feet with her tears. You gave me no kiss of greeting when I entered, but she's not stopped kissing my feet. You gave me no oil to anoint my head, but she's anointed my feet with perfumed oil. And I tell you this, Simon, her sins, though they are many, they are forgiven. And thus, she loves a lot. Because those with little forgiveness have little love. Now, Jesus turned at this, he turned to her and he said, your sins are forgiven. And with this, the crowd that was there began to murmur, and they say, who is this that forgives sins? But Jesus said to her, your faith has made everything okay. 
go in peace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus over for dinner. The Pharisees, if you spend any length of time in the church or any time reading the Bible in the New Testament, you're going to run across Pharisees. And it's an important concept. They're very important to know about because they're very uh, common. They're, they play a huge role in the gospel story. It's the life of Jesus. In all fairness, the Pharisees get pretty much a bad rap. They are pretty much uh, denounced and, and dis, uh, despised. And there's good reason for that. Of, of all the people in Jesus' day and time, they were the most, you could say, perhaps fundamentalist. They were very legalistic, very rule-centered. And they were, in their process of this, very judgmental. They had a strong view of what God wanted them to do, the, the Ten Commandments, the laws of Moses, and how they were to be lived out in day-to-day -day life. And they not only applied themselves with great rigor to be people who followed the rules and were godly, they were moral, they were upright, they did everything that God wanted them to do. They tended to be judgmental, looking and evaluating everybody else who didn't quite do it as well as they did, which was pretty much everyone. They evaluated everyone and said, you, you, you're not spiritual enough, you're not moral enough, you're, you're, you're transgressing the Sabbath by doing work on the Sabbath or walking too far. far. All of these things. And so they, they, they could be a very narrow, judgmental, critical people. Jesus got mad at them saying, you know, you're constantly telling people what they should do. You're constantly telling them where they're wrong. And you don't lift a finger to help them. That's what Jesus was really all about. It was, wasn't just calling us to right living, which is really important. In that sense, the Pharisees, we can agree with them. They're calling people to godliness. But what they did, the error that the Pharisees did, is they, they were more interested in just showing off of how good and moral and spiritual and upright they were and validating that by pointing out how bad and foolish and wicked and ungodly everybody else was. So the Pharisees weren't very well liked. And I suspect this Pharisee, when he invited Jesus to dinner, he was scouting out the new teacher. It was for evaluation. He wanted to find out. He maybe heard the rumors, and maybe he'd even heard him teach here or there, and he wanted to get to know him a little better. But I think he's scrutinizing. And I think the question that's in his heart that, that's reflected, it, says, it, is, it indicates, it suggests that he was pondering, is this guy for real? Is he really from God, or is he a fraud? What do I know about this guy? What well, happens while they're at the table that this woman comes in? And this is scandalous. The Greek word for scandal Scandalon, we get the word scandal from the Greek word scandalon. And scandalon is, simply means a, a, something you trip over. It's a block in the path. It's a log that's fallen across a dark path and you're walking and you trip. A scandalon is, a, is an object that is a cause of tripping. And it can be not just an object in a path, but anything moral. And there's scandal in this story. There's a, a woman in, the, in a men's meal. It's scandalous. Uh, touching him. Scandalous. I mean, it was just un not done. And touching his feet is not done. This is scandalous. But that's, that's the smaller part of it, really. A valid. There's multiple levels of scandal and shock that's going on here. But what's really scandalous is that this woman, uninvited, barges in and falls at the feet of Jesus, weeps, so that the, the, the Greek word that's used where it says wet his feet with her, Tears, the same word for wet is one of the, the falling rain. Her tears fell like rain on his feet. And it's such a tender picture. And such a, a, a picture of a broken person cleaving to somebody that she loves. Someone who's been hopeless, finding a source, an anchor, a place for hope. And she cleaves to his feet and she's weeping and takes her hair and dries his feet with her hair. Maybe she felt like this is wrong, I shouldn't be touching him. And I've got tears all over his feet, and she's concerned of, of doing it wrong and, and being wrong to him. And she, she, she dries his feet and kisses his feet and then anoints them with this very expensive oil. And, and it says that in the very beginning, when she came in, a woman who was a sinner came in. Somehow, this is where the real scandal hits. Not just that she's a woman and not just that she's touching him, but who this person was. This is the real scandal. That she's not good. 
she's, she's a problem. She's not godly. She's not moral. She's not spiritual. She's, she's the kind of person that Pharisees do not hang around with. She's the kind of person that Pharisees would point out in condemnation. That they, they, would, she, they would judge people like her as inadequate and failed and worthless. They wouldn't do anything to help her either. But they're not the, this is not the kind of person that would come to this sort of place. This is not the kind of person to be welcome in this sort of place. And the Pharisee, Simon, is scandalized by this. And he says, and, and this is his evaluation of Jesus, the very fact that Jesus allows this, and this is very important to grasp, Jesus allows this, the very fact that he allows it says something about him, doesn't it? It reveals his heart. It reveals what matters to him. It reveals that people like this matter to him. Maybe not to Pharisees, but that people like this matter to him. But Simon is sitting across with the opposite assessment. And his conclusion is, this is not really a prophet. This man must not be a prophet. Because if he was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is who's touching him. In other words, he would know what she is like and wouldn't let this go on. Prophets, people who are from God, people who are bearing God's message, God's heart, God's perspective, don't hang around people like this. And if he was really godly, he would have dismissed her in an instant. And the fact that he didn't shows that he's not from God. That's Simon's conclusion. Now, the problem is, is in Simon's theology, his understanding of God. And that's where it all comes down to, isn't it? That's where all the problems bubble up in our lives. There's a misunderstanding about God. And Simon, he's lost all concept of forgiveness as grace. He believes, I, I think, he believes in forgiveness. You can't read the Old Testament, his Bible. You cannot read it without knowing grace and forgiveness. It talks over and over. God's promises, I will forgive my people. I will heal them. Jeremiah, I'll give them a new heart, a heart that follows after me, and I will forgive all their iniquity. The Psalms, we've looked at so many Psalms where David and others would say, you know, forgive me, wash me clean, purge me with hyssop, create in me a new heart, Lord. Against you and you alone I've sinned. You can think of Isaiah, you know, you're, at the very beginning, the prophet Isaiah, and he says, though your sins are as scarlet, I will make them as white as wool. I will make them as white as snow. The, the Old Testament, Simon's Bible, is filled with forgiveness. And I think he not only believed in forgiveness, I think he had a concept that forgiveness was a gift, that you don't really earn it or deserve it. But here's where he blew it. He believed it was given as a gift to people like him, not people like her. People who tried to do a good thing would get God's forgiveness. People who were sinful like her wouldn't. He, he made a clear differentiation between his life, which perhaps is not perfect. He acknowledged he, he needs forgiveness, I think. But forgiveness isn't given to just anyone. Forgiveness is given to those to whom it should be given, to the worthy, to whom it's appropriate. In other words, to those who've earned it, who deserve it, not to the unworthy. And he's lost all sense of what forgiveness really is, that it's grace, it's a gift. He believes that if there is a gift element to it, it still has to be deserved. God might, you could picture this, you, you, have, you work for someone and they, you've earned $5 and they give you 6 And it's a gift, it's grace, undeserved bonus. That's how he's viewing God's mercy. He works, he labors, he's moral, he's upright, he walks the right path, he's not like her. And while God gives this gift of forgiveness, it's given to the people to whom it's worthy and as soon as he said that, as soon as he lives that, as soon as he thinks that, as soon as we think that, it reveals that we know neither the meaning and depth of forgiveness or the God who gives it. Jesus, he knew she was sinful. 
We don't know how. I mean, it says later, he, 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 he said, I tell you, her sins, which were many, are forgiven. He knew. Forgiveness doesn't mean that God doesn't care about sin. Do whatever you want, and we'll just call it even. That's a misunderstanding. God cares deeply about sin. He wants us to walk lives that are righteous and moral and godly. But this, the reality is that this woman is so broken that her life is beyond any help that she could give. She could never earn it or deserve it. And she falls on Jesus' feet in sorrow and regret and shame and essentially just says, help me. And it's her trust of him that changes everything. And Simon the Pharisee is scandalized by the fact that this woman whom the whole village knows is a sinner, is being treated like an equal by Jesus. And God would never do that. That's his theology. And again, we don't know what she did. We don't know what she was like. It just says that vague, broad word in the text twice at the beginning and the end. She was a sinner, or she'd done many sins. We don't know. People have speculated. that Was she a prostitute in town? Was she an adulteress? broken up marriages? Was she a telemarketer? I mean, who knows? Um, but the bottom line for her, and it really doesn't matter, the bottom line for her is that she saw in Jesus something that nobody else was offering, certainly not the Pharisees. She saw something in Jesus that gave hope. It didn't turn a blind eye to what she had done, but it was wide eyes wide open to who she was. And it was love. She knew that he loved her, and she responds. What she did is just pure love. You can't describe it as anything other than that. Pure, beautiful, compassionate, tender act of love for her, for him. And she falls at his feet, and she worships. She clings to him. It's really indescribable what occurs. In fact, when the Gospel of Matthew tells the same story, he, he uses slightly different, and, and the Pharisees, the, the disciples get mad at Jesus for the waste of the perfume that could have been sold. And Jesus said, leave her alone. He defends her. He said, you leave her alone. She's done a beautiful thing for me. And she's prepared me for burial, is the way he puts it. Myrrh is a spice that's used for, the, for bodies in a burial. And she had anointed his feet with the myrrh, and she, Jesus says, you leave her alone. She's done something beautiful, and he says these wonderful words. He said, as long as the gospel's going out, this story's going to be told about her, and it is. She is beautiful. Whatever errors she had and had done, she is beautiful in her love for Jesus and her passion to get it right and her recognition that he's different than all the Pharisees and all the other people. He can set things right and wants to set things right. And, and he's not like them that just heaps more burdens on their shoulders. He's different, and he forgives. And she comes to him. And, and everything's set new. And for the Pharisee, for Simon, this was a scandal. It was absolutely scandalous to think that God would deal, would want to deal, would, would uh, one of God's men would allow himself to be touched by a person like this. It's disgusting. But what he didn't know is that's the whole heart of God. He touches people like that. He calls for people like that, for us. That's us. It's really important to understand that. That's us. That's me. That's you. When Jesus said those words, it, it, it's in the parable, it's priceless words, it's very important. I think it gives a clue to the whole issue. He said there's two, a creditor with two debtors. One owed 500 silver coins, the other 50. 500 silver coins is about a year and a half salary. 50 silver coins is about a month and a half, five weeks of, of salary. And it says this crucial line. When they could not pay, he released the debt of both. There is no question that there are some sins that are worse than others. They're not all equal. And that's pretty obvious, right? I mean, 
you can lie about the fish you caught. You can come home and tell your wife that I caught this amazing fish and it was four pounds and it was, you know, and you're lying because it was a minnow and you had to throw it back and, and it's a lie and that's sin. But that's not the same as hitting somebody while you're driving drunk and taking their life. There are different sins and different attitudes, sinful attitudes. They're all different levels. But here's the thing that we have to understand. If we're going to be free of a pharisaical heart, the heart of a Pharisee, the heart of a Pharisee would look at the reality that there are different levels of sins and different extremities and different types and severities, and he would say, you are doing all the bad ones, and I only do little ones. Mine are pretty innocent and naive, and I trip once in a while, but you do the big ones. And God forgives me because he knows I'm walking this righteous path, but you are under his wrath. The pharisaical heart looks at other sins as worse than their own. But Jesus looks at our sins and acknowledges that while one debt may be bigger than the other, and this is what's crucial, neither can be paid by the person. The debt of my sin, which are pretty boring, I'd never be on Dr. Phil or Oprah, my sin, the debt of my sin are beyond my ability to pay. I am hopelessly lost and in debt. And if God did not wash it clean and forgive it scandalously, say, I forgive you. You're free to go. You're free to live. If he didn't do that to me, not just the most heinous, but to me, I would never be in a relationship with God. I would never have heaven as my destiny and future. I would never have the hope of forgiveness and new life that he brings. It's a gift that he gives. And any of us, and all of us, experience it ever and only as a gift of his grace. We don't earn it. We don't get it because we're better than others. We're all equally in need of it, and he gives it to us. And frankly, that's scandalous to a lot of people. There are a lot of people who don't like the image, the picture of, of God just lavishing the sinful, the, 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 the wicked, the evil, lavishing forgiveness upon them. There are people that have struggles with the thought of being in heaven with murderers and rapists and child molesters. You can see it in different places. There's a man I deeply respect on the radio. I like listening to him, but he's wrong on this. A man named Dennis Prager. Jewish man, very smart man, good man, moral man, has excellent things to say. But he has explicitly said that the reason he is not a Christian is because he cannot buy the Christian depth of forgiveness that lets the guilty just walk away as if nothing happened. He said that is what keeps him from becoming a Christian. If you've gotten a chance ever to read C.S. Lewis's wonderful book, the Great Divorce, a, a bus trip from hell to heaven, where they go and visit heaven for a little bit. And early on in the book, one of the people that comes up, he, he bumps into an old friend, and, and he says, Tom, what are you doing here in heaven? What are you doing here? And he says, well, it's kind of a surprise to me as well, you know, but a lot of changes happened after we last saw each other. And, and he says, but you murdered George. You murdered him. How could you possibly be here when you murdered him? And he says, well, George is here too. And he said, I'll introduce you later. You get to see him if, if you stay up. And he said, but how could you be here? You're the murderer of George, and he's here, and you're here, and you get along? And he says, yeah, it's kind of a strange story. And, and it goes on. It's wonderful. But it's this image. And in fact, the, the guy that had come up from hell, he's mad. He says, I'm living in a shanty. I'm living in a terrible place. And it's dark and gray. And you're here. And you're a murderer. And, he, and I, have, I was a good man. I mean, I wasn't perfect, but I was good. And I tried to be moral and upright. And I was not a murderer. And if, if that's how this whole thing works, that murderers are here, then I'm going back there. I don't want to be a part of this. And C.S. Lewis is way to describe the scandal of forgiveness that when we're in heaven we're going to be singing hymns next to murderers and against bad people and ungodly people just like us we're going to be all singing together the songs of his forgiveness you know maybe one of the most amazing scandals that i can think of in all this and pondering the sermon this week and looked up 
the, the story of Jeffrey Dahmer, if you remember that. This is a horrific evil. In fact, I, I almost wish I hadn't looked it up. I read things that I just, you know, once you read it, you can't get it out of your head. Disgusting things, un, unbelievable things of, of a murder and cannibalism, and it was worse. Jeffrey Dahmer was convicted and sent to multiple life sentences in prison. He'd confessed, so they didn't give him the death penalty. He was in prison. And not long after he got into prison, in his first year, he asked for a Bible. And after he started reading the Bible, he asked if a pastor would visit him. And a Church of Christ pastor started visiting him. And over the year, the next year, Jeffrey Dahmer became a born-again Christian gave his life to Jesus, was baptized by this pastor and believed that he was going to heaven and the pastor believes that he was. It was, seemed as genuine as it could be. And he was eventually, sadly, he was murdered in prison by a, another prisoner. But if what we hold to be true really is true, that when we come to Jesus and we say, I'm sinful and I've done horrific things and I'm wrong and I'm bad and I, just, I need your grace, I need forgiveness... And I don't deserve it, and I, don't, I haven't earned it, and there's nothing I could do to, to get it. I just ask you, give it to me for free. And when we do that, when you do that, and I do that, and Jeffrey Dahmer does it, the Bible says what happens is Jesus' words, you know, it's the same words that he said to the woman. I tell you this, though your sins were many, they're forgiven. That's astonishing. That should move you to the core of your being. This isn't pharisaical laws and regulations and rituals. We're talking about a God who loves us so much that he was willing to die so you wouldn't have to. It's not that the penalty or the sin or the evil was ignored and, and whitewashed. It was paid for by another. The penalty that I owed and you owed was put on another who was completely, perfectly innocent. And he died. He shed his blood that should have been mine. And he died for me. And by my coming and your coming to Jesus and we say, God, I have no right to ask this, but would you apply his grace to my life and make me whole? And when we believe like that, he says, your sins are forgiven. That's his word to us. Your sins are forgiven. He doesn't ignore them. He knew exactly. He says, her sins, though there are many, they're forgiven. He knows what I've done, what you've done. That's not the point. The point is his grace and his blood is capable of covering every sin that's ever been done. And we have forgiveness in him as a free gift. And that means, if this is true, that means when you and I get to heaven and we're singing with Jacob leading up in the front with the angels and we're all standing and singing, that it might be possible that she's not only standing next to us, Jeffrey Dahmer's on the other side and Mother Teresa on the other side of him. And that's the scandal of grace. That's the scandal of forgiveness. It doesn't matter how broken you are, how wounded you are, how horrific your life has been. God's forgiveness is so massive and wondrous, it can pull us all in and make us equal on the plane and set us right. And what this does to me, and I hope it's what it does to you, that when I heard about this 40 years ago, it made me fall in love with Jesus, that he would love me this much to do this. When my father-in-law died last November and just the week before, I said, what do you think we'll be like in heaven? And he just sat for a minute and thought, and he said, what I want most is to fall at the feet of Jesus and hold them and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's love. Forgiveness, if you really know what forgiveness is, if you really know what the grace of it is, that you haven't earned it, it's a free gift, scandalously given. When you understand that, if it doesn't awaken your heart to a passionate love for Jesus, then you don't understand it. It should inspire you and awaken you, not to a life of pharisaical rules. Who cares about that? It should awaken us to a life that says, Jesus, how can I live for you? How can I show the world your love for them? How can I live out the love that you've given to me? How can I, how can I thank you? And that's the Christian life. And that's what it looks like. And there's a power that happens that changes things. It changes us and it changes the world when we live it like he lived it. When we forgive people in his name, there's an inward and an outward dimension of this. Inwardly, we must know it's a gift. There's nothing in us that deserves us. There's nothing in this, in me, in, in us, that deserves what God has given. And we have to know that inwardly. But outwardly, there's an expression. 
that we give forgiveness as liberally and freely and graciously and radically and recklessly as he gave it to us. We scandalize the world with our instant forgiveness, our forgiving of others who truly wrong us. We don't water it down and wash it away and act like it didn't because we know what they've done, but we, we forgive. And there's a power when we do that. That's when you get set free, when the person who's wronged you and hurt you and shunned you, and you, you forgive them, and you let it go. You let it go. When you tell people that you forgive them and you, you want a relationship, when someone asks you, forgive me for what I've done, you say, I forgive you, and you let it go. And that's when the freedom of forgiveness happens. It's a big step. But it's the only way it manifests in reality. Before we came here, we lived in London. Most of you know that. We lived in London for three and a half years. And before London, we lived in the Seattle area, way out in the country, actually, on the flank of Mount Rainier. And we were on a plateau that came down from Mount Rainier. And on the, there was a river on each side of it. On the south side was the White River. And it was called that because there were glaciers on Mount Rainier and this silt came down. And it made the, the river chalky, milky white. And on the north side, very close to our church, very close to Linda's my house, was a, the Green River. And it was called the Green River because it was green. And we lived just uh, about a mile from the Green River. Green River was most famous, not because it's a pretty little river winding down from the mountains in western Washington, but because of something more infamous, the Green River Killer. The greatest serial or greatest in the sense of magnitude not quality, uh, a, a serial murder in the United States history. I think 48 women he, he confessed to killing. And when I lived there, this was all going on. There were bodies that were found while I was a pastor two or three miles away in our church, bodies that were periodically found along the Green River and in that whole region. And he eventually caught him, which is a long story, and they brought him to trial, and, and to avoid the death penalty, he pled guilty to all 48 or something like that and, and was convicted. But I want to show you, and it's, it's subtle, but I want to show you something that happened at his sentencing. And I want you to listen to what the people say and say, which is more your attitude when, when there's wrong that's been done around you? And what would God have us do? Watch this. Ellie Ridgeway sat there stone-faced as victims' relatives damned him and mocked him. He's an animal. I wish for him to have a long, suffering, cruel death. He's going to go to hell, and that's where he belongs. But then the emotionless facade finally cracked when the father of one of his victims appeared to surprise him with a dose of human kindness. Mr. Ridgeway, um, there are people here that hate you. I'm not one of them. You've, you've made it difficult to live up to what I believe, and that is what God says to do, and that's to forgive. You are forgiven, sir. Or stood up and said, I hate you. You're going to hell. I hope you suffer. And he watched impassively, but it was this father that said, I forgive you, that broke through the heart of a serial killer. The power of forgiveness is unbelievable, but it's, it's scandalous. It means going to people who don't deserve it, even people like him and people like me, and saying you're forgiven. But the whole story of the Christian gospel and what this beautiful lady shows us is that the heart of God is not like a Pharisee, it's scandalously loving and gracious. And if it weren't so, we would have no hope. But because it is so, we have all the hope in the world. And we have a whole new way to live, free. The freedom of forgiveness. It's ours. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we pray that you would unleash your gift of forgiveness upon us, that we would live it, that we'd receive it. Lord, help us fall in love with you afresh that we would know you and, and walk with you and, and be passionate for you. Protect us from Pharisee hearts, Lord, that would just look at others in judgment and help us to live lives that lift others up. 
Lord, help us to forgive those who've wronged us and help us to bring new life and help us, Lord, to remember that we can come to you, that the broken are welcome, that the sinful are invited, that we can come to you, Lord. So help us, Lord. Help us hold nothing back. Help us to come to you and find your forgiveness. In Jesus' name.